Hello and welcome. British director John Schlesinger's switch from acting to directing proved remarkably successful with a string of award-winning films including Billy Liar, Darling, Sunday Bloody Sunday, Far From the Madding Crowd and Marathon Man. He directed eight major stars in Oscar-nominated performances including Julie Christie, Peter Finch, Glenda Jackson and Laurence Olivier. But his crowning achievement was his Best Director Oscar for Midnight Cowboy, which also won Best Picture in 1969, starring Dustin Hoffman and John Voight. Then, 16 years later, he tackled the controversial movie The Falcon and the Snowman with Timothy Hutton and Sean Penn. Based on the book of the same name, it told the story of two young Californians who found themselves caught up in a real-life spying drama involving the Russians, CIA and drug dealing. The two men, Christopher Boyce and Dalton Lee, were eventually jailed for their efforts and at one time were described as America's most wanted spies. They were branded traitors by many and heroes by some and their story made headlines around the world. I spoke to John in Los Angeles shortly after the film had opened. What, what was it that intri in, intrigued you or interested you about, about the film? Was it the politics of it? Was it, was it the two characters and, and uh, the really. strained mixture? I think it's the characters and the um, and the story. The story is very extraordinary, um, and that's what really made me want to do it. I mean, the politics are kind of interesting, but uh, th that wasn't the prime thing that attracted me. I can understand that it might be. Uh, I think that the Australian audience may be interested in the politics of it because it affects them. Yes, but no more. So, I mean, it, once they see the film, it'll be the characters, of yes, course, that will character. work it's or not. For yes, them. yes. But I just—I was just curious because looking at the films that you've made over the years, whether or not the, the, because it's a strange, it's not—it's not, it's not outright politics, really. I mean, it's a—it's a spy thriller as much as as it's much a as it's politics. Piece as mm. well as yes, but the politics, although uh, I mean, the, the the motivations of the two characters are so terribly naive in a way, and um, I. I understand where they were coming from, and therefore I suppose I don't think I, if I hadn't been sympathetic to them in a sense, uh, I could never have made the film. In what sense? Well, I think that there, there will be some people, and have been some people, who've simply said, you know, anybody that does what they did would be beyond the pale, and they're not worth bothering with. I don't happen to take that attitude, actually. I mean, I think that I don't condone what they did in any way, mm. but I can understand w what motivated the characters. I mean, a sudden impulse on the one hand, outraged by certain goings on, and the other one, a kind of total fantasy. So that's what interests me about the uh, Dalton Lee character, mm. this sort of fantasy life, well, which interested me. Well, let's, let's take the first point. Uh, uh, the Americans take, and I suppose now the English, because it's happened to them so often, the Australians haven't had that sort of thing, except once in 1954 where we had a, a well, spy case. the English case. Americans take very different attitudes. Yes, I know. That's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the Americans are, react very, very strongly, as, we, as we're witnessing now with this, uh, is it North Virginia or Virginia or somewhere they found this, this guy? Yeah. So and what's your attitude then to, to traders and, and, I mean, are you saying that if there's some human justification for it, then you're not prepared necessarily to forgive them? But you understand, to a large degree, why they may have done it. Well, you see, I don't think that... that uh, I mean, I, I think there are certain people that, that do it for, for, you know, really are professional spies, and I can't in any way condone that at all. I mean, uh, uh, that I, 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 I'm not interested in to deal with, except, I don't know if you saw, the Englishman abroad. In I did. I loved it. And... There again, you know, we're treading on strange ground, mm. um, but, but it, we weren't dealing with him, we were dealing with it from the human point of view, mm -hmm. and it is that that I suppose I'm interested in. Mm. I mean, I'm interested in anybody that puts themselves into a corner, and, and the pressure of being a spy, of leading that kind of double life for so long, is intensely interesting from a character point of view. But, I just I was mean, I, but from, from the point of view of, I, do, I can't. I mean, of course what he did was ultimately a criminal act, but I can't view them as criminals in a funny way. I mean, I, I think that... Um, 
I suppose I'm so cynical about world politics and about the, the powers that be and mistrust it all so totally, which is a very naive thing to say, but, but I do. I'm not really so political. So do I. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a political animal. I know perfectly well they've got something else up their sleeve, something, you know, fa fail safe all, all along the line. So, I have to, I'm emotionally much more upset by terrorism, acts of terrorism, which actually kill people, by the, than by the, the thought that possibly what somebody's done may have resulted in whatever. Yes, sure. You're, you're talking in a, generally now, yes, aren't generally. you? Yes, I'm talking yeah. generally. I mean, in the case of, uh, of Chris Boyce, it seemed to me that I understand why at that moment, disillusioned as he was, um, he did, I don't agree with what he did. So you're saying that it wasn't justified in your view? No, I don't think it's justified, but I understand why mm -hmm. he did it. Absolutely. I don't think it's justified. I, don't think, it's, uh, I, don't think, I think there's nothing that justifies actually selling a country down the river. Mm. And what about Dalton? Was he justified in what he was doing, or was he, as you said, a fantasist? I too, think it's a, a fantasy. I think he's a, mm. a fantasist in it for the adventure. I mean, they were terribly naive about mm. that. I don't think he ever thought it through for a second. He was stoned out of his mind. You know, hooked on drugs and the power game that he was playing and the fantasy game he was playing. That's the where we came at the characters from. Mm -hmm. That's what I was in. Why I was interested in it. And um, the Guy Burgess story again is a, it was another kind of. It was the. It was the story of really of isolation and loneliness and and, and the desire to get back to roots. Something I know all about. Yes. Yeah. Well, but, but coming coming back to this, um, I notice in, in the production notes there's a reference made to which suggests it doesn't spell out, but it suggests that uh, as there must be in any film, um, you know, so much is fact and, and so much is is fiction essentially. How much apart from what we know is fact in the film? What what can we take as it's been basically well, you can gospel. never, you can never, can you know what someone actually said? How a conversation went? Well, I was wondering, did 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 the writers, did the researchers, did anybody go and talk to to uh, Chris Boyce? Yes, yes, Tim Hutton did a great deal, um, and he was very helpful. I mean, uh, Dalton Lee did, wanted very little to do with it, if anything. Although Sean uh, Sean Penn went to see him, not to be outdone by Tim Hutton, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh, uh, Tim forged a very um, close bond with Chris Boyce. Uh, I wanted to remain fairly objective because I realised that nine years or whatever it was after the event, their attitudes will have changed and hardened. And um, uh, I didn't really want to... I mean, one, one has a moral responsibility to anybody when you're, when you're basing something on, on live people. At least I think you have. And I didn't want the extra burden of a kind of emotional responsibility as well, having got to know them in a sense. And we were doing a film about the actions of people as they were happening nine years before, the, the way they are now, if you know what, what I mean. Mm. Nevertheless, I was very happy that Tim, provided he wasn't going to say to me every day on the set, listen, uh, this didn't happen this way, and etc., etc. Did he Chris in fact Boyce say that? says, no, I, he, he took the point. Um, I mean, Chris Boyce, I think, wanted to relive his life in a funny way through Tim Hutton and the making of the film. And he was immensely worried by the fact, not so much that the politics weren't going to be handled right, or even the family relationship. He was, his concern was the falconry, funnily enough. He was very really? yes, he was very concerned that we got the falconry right, and Tim Hutton certainly went and learned all about that, if he possibly could. And he wasn't particularly concerned at all that he well, was I mean, represented and what he did was represented um, I, I think he, he read the script, and I don't think it's, it's represented inaccurate. It was from Tim, from Chris Boyce that we knew about Half a League being his father's favourite poem. Um, it 
wasn't in the book the fact that um, his father said let him be judged, but we heard it from somewhere else, of fairly authentic um, sources. sources yeah. Yeah. So did Tim bring anything specifically to you that he'd gained or gleaned from? Oh yes. I mean like... It's awfully difficult. One of the problems about condensing time in a film, and of course that we've had to do, mm -hmm. and condensing characters, is that it all seems to happen very fast because you're doing a whole, you know, years in two hours or whatever, two hours and a bit. And that gives the filmmaker and therefore the writer obviously enormous problems in adaptation uh, particularly when we just didn't we don't have time in a film to do all the early life and everything that built up I mean the story in this particular instance really begins once they start to go down to Mexico and sell secrets to the Russians that's when the action begins mm. everything up to there which is essential but is difficult to condense. It was our biggest problem mm. in, in, in making it really, whether we've succeeded. Well, you have to be subjective in that situation, don't you? I mean, because yeah. of the amount of material and, and the time really and so on. It's really tough. I mean, mm. um, and it's tough. I don't care that the thing, you know, the, a lot of people have said, why isn't it explained more? Well, it's an inexplicable act. Mm. Can't explain what made him at that moment seeing a cipher card in the shredding machine go over and take it, having found out the information that he found out. Um, and um, I, I am mine. I don't think you have to explain it, because I think it is explained yeah. in, in, enough. But nevertheless, the early life, I'd like to have spent more time developing that, obviously. Because I think, so that, I think there will be a great curiosity. I mean, there, there is here, I suppose, if, if people have seen it to want to know some more if they haven't been able to read about the background. Because I think people uh, who give any thought to a film and to characters that are, have been taken from real life want to know the motivation. The motivation's there. The characters. Yes, but, but the but motivation in the, in the structure. I mean, I take your point, though. The you motivation can't... is there, but you can't <clears throat> explain an act that was of the moment. Mm. That's the point. Mm. And there were those people that said, oh, thank God you didn't dot your I's and cross your T's. And, uh, and there were those that said, I wanted more to know why. Mm. There will always be. There will always be. Mm. And, and, you know, so decisions were made both over the long period we took to, to, to work on the script and, and, you know, to the final cut. John Schlesinger kept working in the film and television industry into the 2000s, but had spread his directing talents into theatre and opera productions. He died on the 25th of July 2003 at the age of 77 in Palm Springs, California.